Very glad to have you here tonight. I want to begin with something rather serious. On March the 19th, agents of the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Agency, ATF, went to the home of Brian Malinowski, the executive director of the Little Rock, Arkansas Airport, and as such, happens to be the highest paid city employee in Little Rock. The agents arrived at his home in 10 separate vehicles at 6 a.m., an hour before sunup. They came to his personal home in one of the nicest neighborhoods in all of Little Rock. We were able to exclusively obtain the video. This is from a neighbor's security camera of the police vehicles arriving. No one has seen this before other than the family. We also obtained from the Malinowski family the video from their Ring doorbell camera, which you're seeing now. After covering up his Ring doorbell, they proceeded to break down his front door and entered his home. Mr. Malinowski and his wife were startled by the noise, as you could imagine, as well as the intrusion. Mr. Malinowski grabbed a pistol that he kept by his bed and went into the hallway hallway where he saw several individuals in the darkness. He fired at their feet. They, in turn, fired at him, striking him in the head, even as his wife was only a couple of steps behind. He died from the gunshots. I am as supportive as I can be of law enforcement. I back the blue. And I give benefit of the doubt to the police officer when one is accused of wrongdoing. Let's be honest, their job is a difficult and a dangerous one. But incidences like this are deeply disturbing and demand transparency and answers. And the answers have not been forthcoming. The federal agents were not there to arrest him. No charges against him had been filed. They were there to execute a search warrant. They ended up executing a citizen in his own home. According to an affidavit, which was the basis of the search warrant and the search warrant itself, which are the only items that have been released to the public, Mr. Malinowski was suspected of violating the so-called gun show loophole, which allows private citizens to sell or buy firearms to other private citizens for their own personal use. And in that application, a federal firearms license is not required unless the person is acting as an actual dealer. But where that line is has never been defined in the law, and it's purely subjective. Malinowski was a gun and coin collector hobbyist. He regularly attended gun shows and set up a table to buy and sell guns and coins. The ATF had placed a tracker on his vehicle. They even went undercover to his table to try and purchase firearms from him. But on March the 19th, he had not been accused or charged with any crime of any kind. One of the attorneys who served as chief legal counsel for me when I was governor was later a U.S. attorney. He's now representing the Malinowski family to get answers regarding the armed raid on the home at 6 a.m. that resulted in his fatal shooting. The ATF has been strangely silent in all of this. Body cameras are required to be worn by agents in such a raid but no footage has been released. In fact, no footage has even been acknowledged to exist. Were they wearing the required body cameras? Did they announce their presence prior to breaking down the door and entering? Did they give an adequate amount of time for the person inside to respond before breaking down the door, which is required under such circumstances? Why didn't they simply stop him as he backed out of his driveway or even find him at work? It's in a very public place, and he's a very public person. And why 6 a.m. when it was still dark and the occupants of the home were likely asleep? It was a search warrant, not an arrest warrant. And why were 10 police vehicles and multiple agents needed to search his home, and for what were they searching? The federal agencies have failed to provide any answers that his family and, frankly, the public have a right to know. I want to be on the side of law enforcement. I want officers and agents to take every measure to protect themselves. But should law enforcement escalate a search warrant to the level of a hostage rescue? And is there a trend to use excessive force to carry out legitimate law enforcement duties 
perhaps as a way to intimidate people with a show of force that is more a military action than a police action. Right here on this show, we've talked with Peter Navarro, a 74-year-old economist who was arrested at the door of an airplane that he was boarding in Washington to travel to Nashville in order to appear on our show. He lives 50 yards from the front door of the FBI. So why did they wait until he was at the airplane boarding door to publicly arrest him, handcuff him, and put him in leg shackles? Just last week, Steve Baker, a journalist with Blaze TV, was on this show. He told of his, his arrest, bound in leg irons, all of this happening three years after he covered the January 6 riots at the Capitol. You may remember a few weeks ago, we had Paul Vaughn on the show, a father of six. And he came to describe his arrest at seven o'clock in the morning at his home when four cars of federal agents arrived at his home and handcuffed him in front of his children. What did he do? He prayed and sang in protest at an abortion clinic near Nashville some three years earlier. Tonight, I call on the ATF and the Department of Justice to provide answers as to why people are having their homes raided by SWAT teams for the mere suspicion of process or paperwork crimes. And what is the justification to break down a door at 6 a.m. and shoot a citizen in the head? And did the agents themselves follow the law that requires body cameras, an announcing of their presence and their intention? If so, release the video. And if not, why not? Who will be held accountable? If you haven't done it recently, read the Bill of Rights. It wasn't written to give the government the right to break into your home and shoot you. Every single one of the 10 amendments constituting the Bill of Rights explicitly limits the government in order to protect your freedom. And some people at the highest levels of the federal government need to read the Bill of Rights very carefully, and they need to obey them, or else they are the ones who need to have their homes raided before daylight and marched off in shackles. My first guest tonight is the founder and president of the Government Accountability Institute, which has been exposing government corruption and misuse of taxpayer money for over a decade. He's a New York Times bestselling author four times over. His latest book has him calling out China's blatant attack on our country. From the seemingly innocent app, TikTok, all the way to a direct involvement in America's fentanyl crisis, he pulls no punches. Please welcome the author of Blood Money, Why the Powerful Turn a Blind Eye While China Kills Americans. One of our favorite guests. Welcome back, Peter Schweitzer. Peter, it's great to have you back. Every time you come out with a book, I say we got to have Peter on because you discover things that no one else has been able to, to get to. And in this book, you talk about that China is not just sort of tinkering around the edges with the yeah. United States. Yeah. It's a full-scale assault on our country and its people. Yeah. Give us some idea. What exactly are they doing? Well, the way I look at it is, in the way China looks at it, they are at war with the United States already. They call it disintegration warfare, and it's designed to fragment or disintegrate American society. And if you look at what's been going on the last five years, uh, the social disruption, the violence, uh, some of these social movements like the trans movement that have emerged, I'm not saying China created them, but China has enhanced them and fanned the flames. Uh, so, for example, you look at uh, the rise in violence on America's street. We've had this phenomenon from 2018 to the present where there's been more of a 1,200% increase in the rate of machine gun fire on the streets of America. Hmm. Where does this come from? Well, in beginning in 2018, China started smuggling into the United States these small devices. They're called Glock switches or auto sear switches. Highly illegal. They convert a Glock handgun to a fully automatic machine gun. And who is China smuggling them to? Criminal gangs and drug dealers. So that's one of the reasons we have more violence in America's streets. 
If you look at some of the social, the angry social protest movements, whether it was in 2020 or the current ones, the pro-Hamas protests that we're seeing, they're really being carried out by two groups which have ties to China. They pledge their allegiance to China and they're driving a lot of these angry social protests. And then if you look at an issue like the trans movement that kind of emerged out of nowhere, yeah. we found out that two of the biggest funders of that movement are actually billionaires that are based in China. And by the way, Governor, they don't advocate for those positions in China itself. They're only pushing that agenda in America. And I think it's because they know and recognize it's a divisive issue that can really tear us apart. You know, Peter, in light of what you've just outlined and discovered in your research, I'm having to wonder, why is the federal government breaking down the doors of American citizens, as I just yeah. discussed, yeah. instead of going after some of these bad actors from China yeah. who are trying to destroy the very fabric of the United States and its people? Uh, America's on fire. These things are happening. China's holding an empty can of gasoline, and our leaders are watching it happen. And the reason is at least some of them are compromised. They have financial entanglements with China, which preclude them from dealing with this because it would be deeply embarrassing and cost them a lot of money. And Peter, you know, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, but every time I turn on the mainstream media, they tell me that it's Russia, Russia, Russia. They're right. the ones that are behind yeah. all of this stuff. You're telling us that your research indicates that a lot of the darkness coming into this country is coming not from Russia. Maybe some, but the bulk of it is China. Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, I'm not saying that Russia doesn't present problems, but Russia's a declining power. Uh, Russia's having a hard time with Ukraine. China is the ascendant power, and they are massively involved in sort of every aspect of what's going on. And they seek to weaponize things, not just to cause us political harm, Governor, but to actually kill Americans. Um, look at, at what happened during 2020, um, during COVID, not just the origins of the virus, but China knew for three months before they told us that they knew that this was a virus and that it was transmittable from person to person. But they waited three months to tell us that that was the case. Why did they do that? During that three months, they cornered the market on masks and medical equipment that doctors could use to protect themselves in treating. That led to more Americans dying. They pushed false narratives during COVID that led to Americans getting mistreatments and dying. So China is actually doing things now that are killing Americans, not even to mention the fentanyl crisis. We, we now have the leading cause of death for young people under the age of 45 is fentanyl. Uh, and this is something that is weaponized by China. People focus on the drug cartels, but the drug cartels are the junior partners, the senior partners here of the Chinese government, which control every aspect of this poison that is killing so many people. I want to get right back to that when we uh, come back from the break. And uh, Peter, it always amazes me when one of your books come out, and this is one that is stunning, and some of the insights every American needs to understand and be familiar with. You'll have a better understanding of what is happening in our culture and why it's happening. We're going to have a whole lot more with Peter. There's just too much to cover, not to. So Keith, if you will remind our viewers who else is coming up on the show tonight, we'll take a break and be back with Peter Schweitzer. Well, still to come, author Karen Kingsbury and actor Scott Reeves discuss their new movie. And be sure to stick around for music from two-time Dove Award winner Billy Gaines, right here on Huckabee. MikeHuckabee.com and sign up for his free newsletter and follow at GovMikeHuckabee on X. And welcome back. We're visiting with Peter Schweitzer. We're talking about his brand new book. It's about China and their involvement in what's happening in our country. It is a, by the way, the number one New York Times bestseller in the country right now. And let me tell you something. If the New York Times acknowledges that Peter Schweitzer's book is number one, it must be overwhelming number one. They would <laughs> never have allowed it to get to number one otherwise. Um, there's a reason people are wanting to read this book. They're learning things they did not realize. You mentioned just before the break the fentanyl issue. 
And most people don't realize, they think, well, it's coming across the southern border, mm -hmm. but that's not where it came from. That's right. That's not where it originated. And I think the other thing that people don't understand is that fentanyl, the vast majority of people that die of fentanyl poisoning don't even know they're taking fentanyl. Mm. It's a college student who's taking uh, an Adderall because he's trying to study for a test. And I certainly don't endorse that. But uh, this is a poisoning, a killing. And what people need to understand is every link of the chain is controlled by China. The precursor chemicals that, that make up fentanyl come from China. 90% of them arrive at the port of Manzanillo in Mexico. Who controls the international terminal in Manzanillo, Mexico? Not an American company, not a Mexican company, a Chinese company. Those precursors are then moved to North Mexico, just along the U.S. southern border, where 2,000 Chinese nationals just happen to be that help the drug cartels take these precursors and mix them into this deadly cocktail. Now they've actually got the fentanyl, but people don't really take fentanyl. They think they're taking something else. You have to lace it into something. You lace it into a fake Vicodin or a fake Adderall. You need pill presses and you need pill molds that make the pills actually look like the real thing even though they're not. The pill presses and the pill molds come from China. And according to our Department of Homeland Security, China sells it to the drug cartels at cost. Mm. They're not even making money doing it. Now that they've got the pills, uh, Governor, they need to distribute them in the United States. They need secure communications. What do the drug cartels use? They use uh, Chinese apps and they use Chinese encryption devices because they know that China will not share the communications of the drug cartels with American law enforcement. And then the final key to the puzzle is the money laundering. Every drug cartel needs to launder money. They used to launder their money through South American banks. The drug cartels now launder their money through Chinese state-owned banks, and they often use Chinese exchange students in the United States on education visas to do so. So this is a Chinese operation. It is revenge for the opium wars, and it is a leasing cause of death for people under the age of 45 in the United States. And our president has said literally nothing to President Xi about this. Is that maybe tied to the fact that his family got $5 million from a company that's owned by the Communist Chinese Party? Yes. Is there a connection? There is, and in, in fact, it's even a little bit closer than that. In, in 2017, he got $5 million, Hunter Biden did from Yi Yiming, a Chinese businessman, an in interest-free forgivable loan to the Biden family mm -hmm. that of course has never been paid. But here's the thing about Yi, the businessman, not only is he tied to the CCP government, he was business partners with a Chinese gangster named White Wolf. And White, White Wolf. White Wolf. Anytime you get a name like White Wolf, it's not a good sign. And a good guy. No, not a good yeah. guy. White Wolf is the head of a criminal gang that set up the Sinaloa cartel in the fentanyl trade. Hmm. So what I'm telling you is there is one degree of separation between the Biden family and the Chinese gang that set up the Mexican drug cartels in, in the fentanyl trade. And, and I think that's clearly the reason Joe Biden does not want to raise this issue. Why else would you not raise the fact that 100,000 Americans that every year were losing more people that died from Vietnam and every combat death since then were losing every year, and he never raises it with President mm -hmm. Xi? I, we've only got about 30 seconds left, but I cannot end without at least asking for a brief understanding of why it is important that the country push back on the use of the TikTok app. TikTok, I quote extensively in the book from Chinese propagandists. They say it's the ultimate Trojan horse. They describe in detail how they use TikTok to manipulate young people in the West emotionally. So while we're debating in Washington, D.C., are they, aren't they? They've already made the decision. And ByteDance, the company that controls TikTok, is not just a Chinese company. It is fused to the hip to the Chinese government. The algorithm that drives that app is not just a company secret. The government declared it a state secret, and the company actually does joint research with the Chinese Ministry of State Security, their spy agency, on how to manipulate people online. So if, if we cannot ban this app, um, it, it's, it's pretty much lost. It's waving a white flag to exactly the Chinese. Right. It's exactly you know, right. No parent should allow his or her teenager or any child to be on TikTok for the simple reasons. And one of the things that I can tell you about Peter's book, every book that he does, he doesn't just say, I think, I feel, I believe. There is extensive source-related documentation. So 
read his book, not so you'll say, oh yeah, I agree with him. Read it because you'll understand where did he get this information and how did he validate it? That's what makes it even more powerful. To order your own copy of Blood Money, Why the Powerful Turn a Blind Eye While China Kills Americans, as well as to keep up with what the Government Accountability Institute is doing to help keep the rest of this country honest, all you got to do is visit Huckabee.tv. Hey, Keith, why don't you tell us who's on deck next? Well, she's been hailed as the queen of Christian fiction. Karen Kingsbury will be out next, along with actor Scott Reeves, to discuss their brand new movie, Someone Like You, next on Huckabee. Welcome back. Karen Kingsbury is a number one New York Times bestselling author whose many novels have sold over 25 million copies, and they've been made into major movies and TV shows. Scott Reeves is someone you're probably familiar with. He's the star of such popular shows as Nashville and General Hospital. Now they've joined talents to help bring Karen's inspiring love story, Someone Like You, and they're bringing it to the big screen. Please welcome Karen Kingsbury and Scott Reeves. One of the things that I'm just thrilled about, this is a film that is based on one of your incredible novels, and those have sold so many copies that I think people already are going to say, oh, I've read the book, I want to see the movie. And you know what I've heard, Karen? People are saying that the movie is as good as the book, and that's something you don't always hear. Well, that's what I think is my favorite part, is God puts the story like a movie on my heart to start with, and now with someone like you, it's actually that same movie now on the screen for everyone. Scott, um, you, you've done a lot of television, a lot of movies. What attracted you to the script and what made you want to be a part of this particular project? Well, first and foremost, Karen. I've been a Karen fan for 20 years. My, my wife, 20 years ago, uh, talked me into reading one of Karen's books, uh, it was the first book in the Baxter series, and it got me hooked. And I devoured every King, a Karen Kingsbury book after, uh, from then on. And so when someone like you came along and Karen called 20 years, we've been friends for 20 years, and we have been wanting to work together. And when this came up, I jumped at the chance to be it because I knew anything. The reason the movie is as good as the book is because Karen and her son wrote the movie also. It wasn't some random script writer who came in and, and wrote it. She's they didn't booger up the book <laughs> exactly. when they made it into a movie, exactly. which sometimes does happen. It, oh, it happens a lot. And, and Karen, something that I found just stunning, you and your husband, instead of going to a bunch of investors and they would have their own you know, sort of fingers in the pie and their spoon in the kitchen with their own spices, <laughs> you guys took your savings and you financed the production of the movie yourselves. That way you had more control of the content. Yeah, we just, you know, we walk by a sign that's in our house every single day and it says, just one life. And that's how we live, that, you know, God's given us only a finite number of pages in the story of your life. And so for us, it was, hey, let's do it. Let's, what are we going to buy some houses? Like, let's go ahead and make a movie and let's do it the way we want to do it and have the message and the hope be authentically like the book. But was that scary? It's I mean, terrifying. you guys kind of put everything you've done, and you, you know, you had a pretty good life, and you bet it all on this movie. You know, I mean, that's a risk, a huge risk. Yeah, I know for us, you know, we've always believed to whom much has been given, much will be expected. And so it was a huge risk. It was terrifying at times. Because, you know, with a book, you can just write it and you can control the weather and you can cast it. You can find the locations and it's just you and the page. But when it's a movie, everything can go wrong. And truly, we prayed for wisdom and favor every day and God brought it. And we had finished on time, on budget. 
And uh, I think I, the movie is one of my favorite things I've ever seen. Give us a synopsis of the plot. What happens? You don't have to give yeah. the whole movie away, of yeah. course, but I want to tell us why this is such a unique film, because it really is. And we would have had no idea that it would come out right when the Alabama Supreme Court ruling happened about embryos being people. But I had found out that embryo adoption was a thing. And mm -hmm. so that sort of spun this story in my heart. But it's about a young architect, Dawson Gage, and he loses his best friend early on in the movie. His, his love for her was sort of undying. And his last thing that he could do for her was, hey, I, he finds out in the grieving, she was born through in vitro fertilization. And so he finds out there was another embryo and it had been donated to someone somewhere. So he wants to find out, like, where is this brother or sister of his friend? And he finds a girl who has no idea that she was adopted as an embryo, and it rocks her world. And as he's kind of walking her through that, he didn't mean to fall in love. Hmm. And, of course, we have Scott, who does the most amazing job as the biological dad, who has lost not just one daughter, but finds the one that they gave away as an embryo, and now has to sort of say goodbye to her too. It's, it's really his, I mean, Scott, your emotion in this movie has been just tremendous. Like people are talking about it. Like this is Academy Award winning performance from Scott. And, and Scott, there must've been a, a serious emotional issue to deal with just oh. dealing with the plot. <clears throat> it was, I knew, I knew if it was a Karen, first of all, if it was a Karen story and something that Karen and Don were at, they were at the helm. I knew it was something I was going to be able to be proud of and dig my teeth into. And um, because they walk the walk and they put the money, their money where their mouth is. Yeah. And so uh, when I saw the character, I was like, oh, wow. You know, I have a daughter that is, this, is the same age as my daughter in this movie that we tragically lose. And um, so, yeah, I had to, it was a hard, it was, that was the hardest part about doing this movie was digging, digging into those emotions and personalizing that, you know, but it was also there's in Karen's stories, there's there's redemption and restoration and finding, you know, finding that unimaginable and joy that you can, that, that, that's beyond our comprehension, you know. Even Come, in tragedy. Yeah. yeah and well, even in the midst of tragedy. Well, it's in the theaters starting this week, just opened and someone like you is in theaters nationwide. If you go to Huckabee.tv, we have links to help you find the theater closest to you, as well as so you can buy tickets. Go see the film. Also, to see Karen Kingsbury and her many best-selling books. We'll link you to those as well. Now, we might just need someone, someone like Keith Bilbrey, who will tell us what's coming up next. Keith? Oh, I'd be glad to. Up next, author... Dr. Jeremiah Johnston, and later, Orkney News with another installment of In Case You Missed It. That's all ahead on Huckabee. Welcome back, everybody. You know, I'm visiting with our next guest, and we're both talking about one of the things that makes this show so much fun is the phenomenal music. You hear little snippets of it. We get to hear much more of it. A good reason that you should come and be in our studio audience. It's made such a wonderful difference because of Trey Corley and the Music City Connection. Would you right. give them a big hand right now? My next guest is a New Testament scholar, commentator, podcaster, foster care and adoption advocate. That's a lot of stuff. Uh, his new Amazon top 10 bestseller is a book called The Body of Proof, The Seven Best Reasons to Believe in the Resurrection of Jesus and Why It Matters Today. Please welcome Dr. Jeremiah Johnston. Thank you, Governor. It's an honor to have you here. Great to be with you. You're one of the busiest guys I think I've ever met. <laughs> you, you have so many things going on. I, I want to briefly just mention that Coming off of Easter that we just celebrated, 
Uh, this book is a, a perfectly timed to remind people that the resurrection is everything. That's exactly right. The resurrection of Jesus is what gives us a living hope. This word hope is mentioned a hundred times in the New Testament, and it's all because Jesus Christ came out of that grave physically alive. And that is something we celebrate every week. Every day is Resurrection Day for the Christians. Well, it's, uh, it's not only a great book, but you also have a supplement to it, the Body of Proof, a study guide. So it's going right. be a great class study for a Sunday school class or small group. And uh, we'll have links to that for people. Thank you. But I want to talk about something that you're doing in Dallas uh, coming up. And it's, uh, I, I've never heard of anything quite like this. It's a massive conference and it's called Chosen. That's right. And it's about the vast number of kids in this country who either are waiting for adoption or they're orphaned or they need foster care. That's How big right. an issue is this? This is an emergency summit that we're hosting at Prestonwood Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, where God has a second home, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> emergency <laughs> summit focused on the 400,000 U.S. citizens under the age of 18 right now in the foster care system in the United States. 400,000, 100,000 right now. One out of four waiting for their forever family. We take this very seriously. With the people of God, there is no such thing as an unwanted child. We believe yeah. both at Prestonwood and at this emergency conference, every child is a wanted child. Who's this conference for? Is it for pastors or is it for Sunday school teachers or social workers? Who needs to sign up and be there? Everyone needs to be part of this conference because if you love Jesus Christ, if you believe in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you believe in Christian ethics and everyone can do something. We're going to empower pastors. I'm so thankful Governor Greg Abbott is going to be there. A lot of people mm. don't realize Governor Abbott's daughter, Audrey, is adopted. Mm. We have Corey and Sadie Robertson's there, the Duck Dynasty family. They've yeah. adopted and fostered children. So we have great influential speakers who are intimately acquainted with the details related to foster care and adoption, but we also want to equip local churches church pastors. You think about it, Governor Huckabee, mm -hmm. 353,000 congregations in the United States. If every church had a foster care adoption ministry, we wouldn't have this issue, right? Mm -hmm. And so we want to encourage pastors. So we want to invite pastors to be part of it. We want to encourage Christians. I, I've learned so much on behalf of our church in this conference about what a critical need this is. We want to encourage Christians to build their awareness. And of course, we want to encourage families, big families, to continue to grow in this area of adoption adoption and foster care. You know, Audrey and I have five children, Governor. Yeah. We have we went from two to five. We have triplets that are seven years old. So I haven't slept in seven years, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> until the motel tonight, which I'm excited right. about. <laughs> we care about families. And, you know, in Mark chapter nine, verse 36 and 37, Jesus was asked, who's the greatest? Yeah. And do you remember what he did, Governor? He brought a child into the middle of the room. And he said, unless you receive a child, this is what it means to receive the kingdom of God. So if you really want to be great for God in his eyes, take care of the vulnerable, take care of the children, take care of those who can't take care of themselves. You know, we're, uh, we're both pro-life, very adamant about that and believe right. that there's no such thing as a disposable or expendable Amen. child. But the burden of the pro-life movement is that with more states putting restrictions, uh, thankfully, hopefully, mm -hmm. fewer abortions, but that also means that some of these babies that will be born are gonna be born to mothers who may really rather turn them over to someone else to raise. Amen. So how big an issue is it for us as pro-life people to also embrace the fullness of life not just up until they're born, but beyond that for their future. That's right. And we applaud these courageous mothers who have these babies and then partner with adoptive families. We want to affirm them. They are courageous. And right in the state of Texas, and I know you're aired globally, but by way of illustration in Texas, we've had 10,000 additional baby births, mm -hmm. thankfully. Um, and yet with that becomes a great responsibility. And remember the most dangerous words. Remember what Ronald Reagan said? I'm, it's the government, yeah. government I'm here to help. Those yeah. are very dangerous words. Dang we believe the church is the greatest force for good on planet Earth. So as Christians, we need to show up and say, yes, we're pro-life. That means we care about every baby, but we also care about life from the womb to the tomb. Amen? And we want to be part of seeing this solution met where we can encourage families so they can be a part. We want to invite people to come to this conference on April 13. But if you can't come to the great nation of Texas, we are streaming it as well, Governor. So you can be part of this conference from all over the world. All you have to do is go to pressonwood.org slash chosen. Let us encourage you. Let us affirm you. Let us equip you and resource you to stand up and be part of the solution.
I think it's an extraordinary thing you're doing. Thank I've you. never heard of any other church that's sponsoring something of this magnitude uh, with the breadth of what you're doing in the Chosen Conference. And I hope that people will sign up. Uh, Dr. Johnson has given you a clear way to do it, but we're going to make it easy for you. If you'll visit Huckabee.tv, we'll not only uh, help you have a link to Dr. Johnson's new book, Body of Proof, also tickets to the April 13th wow. Chosen Conference at Prestonwood Baptist Church in Plano, Texas, just north of Dallas. Uh, speaking of chosen, I've chosen Keith Bilbrey to tell us what's coming up on the show. Here he goes. I feel honored. Stay close because in case you missed it is next. That music from Billy Gaines. That's all ahead on Huckabee. Huckabee.tv and get your very own Made in the USA Huckabee mugs, t-shirts, and more. Well, from bad romances to cola swilling donkeys, we got the news that'll make your tummy tingle on In Case You All right, February brought us Valentine's Day, a holiday celebrating romance. But there isn't a holiday to commemorate romances that, well, may have gone sour. Luckily, some people are inventing creative ways to tell that special person, boy, am I glad to get rid of you. <laughs> Oh. Here's a, for instance, a car scrapping company in Great Britain had a Valentine promotion called Scrap Your Ex. Applicants could go online and say why their ex deserved to be junked. And the winners got photos of a car with their former crush's name on it, painted on the car, getting crushed for real and dumped into the junkyard. Oh, that's... That's, that's cruel, yeah, isn't it? That's, that's pretty... You know... Keith, I'm shocked that Taylor Swift hasn't already written a song about this. <laughs> well, Carrie Underwood. Yeah, yeah. Did she? She did that song before he cheats about smashing her yep. ex's truck with a baseball bat. Oh. Yeah. Well, she's a do-it-yourselfer. Yeah. Anyway, the company described the Scrap Your Ex promotion as cathartic. Okay. Anybody got a dictionary? Uh, you know, um, <laughs> these folks could probably write for this show. They could write as poorly as we do anyway. <laughs> All right, the smokinggun.com brings us a Hux criminal mastermind from Calgary, Canada. You know, drug dealers always give you the first sample free. Well, this guy took the free sample idea literally. Police raided his house and they found a box of business cards. And stapled to each card was a tiny Ziploc baggie of cocaine. Oh, hmm. no that was way. his staple product. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. There. Huh? Took me a while, but yeah, I you got it. <laughs> the cards all had the fake name Alex Lee, but here's what's crazy it had his real address on the card. I suspect he'd been sampling the merchandise himself. Uh huh. You know, I keep telling people you can't get away with stuff this obvious unless you knew, use the name. Hunter Biden. <laughs> <laughs> then you're clear. <laughs> All right. Oh, Woo. Next, we turn to the animal kingdom. In Devon, England, a donkey named Joey developed a severe stomach blockage. To save his life, vets fed him six liters of full sugar cola a day mm. for four days. You know what that did? What? It dissolved the blockage like a drain cleaner. I'll have to remember. Ooh, something to think about if you drink a lot of cola. <laughs> hey, Trey, you drink a lot of cola, don't you? Not too bad. I mean, a little bit. All right. Well, they say things go better with Coke. <laughs> <laughs> and it did help him go. Wow. Yeah. You know, they warn this should only be done under a vet's supervision. And you should never give cola to a healthy donkey, no matter how much he begs for it when you take him to the movies. Uh, I'm glad to know that. Yeah, you'll... Keep that in mind. <laughs> All right, finally, our video of the week. Watch closely because this happens really fast. A car was backing up in the snow when a puppy ran behind it, but he was saved 
by Superdog. Let's see that again in slow motion. Can we do it? Here we go. You see the puppy? Now look at the dog. What a save. Oh, man. That is wonderful. This is why I love dogs, uh -huh. sometimes more than people, because uh -huh. they're better than most people. That's right. Anyway, that's not an In Case You Missed It story. My friend, that is a Huck's Hero story. And on that heroic note, we're going to wrap this up. But until next time, remember, we read the news. That's our show for tonight, folks. Go to Huckabee.tv for more information on all of tonight's guests and to see an online exclusive performance from Billy Gaines. Join Huckabee next week for For King and Country, Rebecca St. James, and more. Thanks for watching Huckabee.